Hello everyone, today is September 17th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. There it is. Alright, as a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I stole that from Greg Morris. We were at a conference once and um, somebody was talking about something and um, Greg just kind of leans over and says, all predictions are about the future. I think he said a lot of shit can happen between now and then, but um, got to keep it uh, <laughs> PG-13. Uh, what are we talk about? Well, I'm not going to spend too much time telling you what I'm going to talk about, but we'll just get busy. Uh, client email, which kind of uh, sparked a few things. And if you have things you want covered, obviously, just shoot me an email or you could ask during the show. Uh, and this is where I, I get a lot of fodder for the show. So uh, you sort of direct where I go with the show. And I think uh, this kind of led me into how you need a framework for your trading. And then, again, I'm going to harp upon the secret to trading. And the secret is there is no secret, but I think that uh, I think that this is going to help you quite a bit if you could do it. Most people cannot. And then lately we'll be talking about uh, sign, signal, setup, and trigger. Michael says, Greg's watering hole is at stocktrust.com. Yeah, I was um, I was supposed to be. Um, there's a chance that I might actually write for them, but uh, nothing has uh, come through just yet. Uh, obviously, we lost a great one uh, over the last week or so, so I'm, I'm pretty bummed out about this, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just one second. But in honor of Mark Douglas, I do want to touch upon some trading psychology things, and I'm sure uh, as time passes, we'll um, – I'll probably dig out his uh, his books, which I, which I have a stack actually. Uh, I have a stack of books that I tend to read or reread before I do some more uh, psychology seminars and such or webinars. And uh, his are definitely uh, on a list, high on the list, uh, especially his first one, The Disciplined Trader. And uh, I'll touch upon that in, in just a minute or two. Um, I got an email from a client. In any case, how serious of a move would you wait for before say the market has made up its mind it sounded like you wouldn't be impressed with anything less than new highs or a big leg low am i on track yeah for the most part jim when we get to the sign signal setup and trigger the trigger is actually pretty close and i still think the market is trouble i'm not going to trouble in trouble I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much on that but i'm just going to kind of touch upon all those things that we've seen over the last uh few weeks and this got me to thinking that you need to have a set of if-then rules. And I think early in my career, I was kind of doing a little um, introspective analysis or, or a little interest, I was being a little introspective this morning. And I thought how very early in my career, when I first started trading stocks, uh, it was in the 90s and the market just mostly went up. So I really didn't have a good framework in place. I think the Asian crisis came along and kind of spanked me a little. And it's like I, I found myself, I did incredibly well early on. I don't know if it was beginner's luck or not. But I don't think I ever really had the full plan in place for for many years or at least five years or so before I really started putting together a plan. And you almost have to have your ass handed to you a few times before you think along these lines and do these things. Um, so I do think you have to have a set of if-then rules. Michael says, once a programmer, always a programmer. You know, maybe that's maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's the programmer in me. I have, um, I have friends in the business that are mechanical traders, or mostly mechanical, I should say, and they think I'm a lot more mechanical than I let on, and I think they're a lot more discretionary than they let on. But I, I think you could boil things down, and, and um, not to get too far sidetracked, but I, someone had um, years ago a, a very intelligent programmer type. Um, I don't know if it was neural nets or not, but uh, – he was, I think he was on the cusp of, of, of programming a lot of my stuff at, at, to a point where it, it actually scared me a little bit because I think that it, it does take discretion. I don't want to digress too far. I didn't mean to get into that aspect, but uh, you kind of made me think about it. Um, 
but I think it's a general framework you have to have. You still have to use your brain. And I think when you go to quantify these things, that's when you start getting into a little bit of trouble. Because what if you're off by a penny and the computer needs to know that that exact? But um, this gentleman I was talking about, I don't want to digress too far into this, but he had a bit of a, uh, like a rule-breaking thing that was allowed and, and into the framework. And so that, that breaking a rule by a penny or whatever – was allowed and then it was that it would kind of uh, the way it would flow and i don't know the proper programming tech uh terminology but it, then it could become actually a new rule in and of itself but anyway i think he was i think he was on to something there but the bottom line is i think that we all have brains in our head and that we should use them so in a case like if the market sets up then you take it depending on the setup but there or as as my friend rob hannah says on a mechanical basis, and I think it might have been, maybe it might have been somebody else at a recent timing research show, if it was, that uh, uh, my apologies. But sometimes there are certain signals that occur or setups where you almost have to take them. And in that particular case, maybe it is mechanical. So an example of that would be, as we're going to look at it just a second or two, would be like a weekly bow tie on the overall market coming off of all-time highs or let's say 10-year highs or 10-year lows or whatever when you see those type of signals you have to you have to take them now whether or not you're trading the outright indices which is a little bit tougher than trading individual stocks at least you recognize that signal and say okay we're going to be short here uh, on certain issues or any, especially in inefficient markets like Forex, where it's inefficient. If you see a pair coming off of major, major lows, let's say 10 year lows and forming a daily bow tie, then you should almost take that signal mechanically. I know it's redundant to say, in my opinion, because me talking, I'm giving you an opinion. I'm no longer allowed to give the opinion of others, by the way. But, um, just ask me, and I'm, I'm sure I'll be happy to. My brother-in-law, his name is Andy. He'll ask you something. He'll ask for your opinion, and he'll you give it to him, your honest opinion, then he'll tell you how you're wrong. So I call it Andying me. You know, he Andy's you. Um, anyway, so anyway, if the market does set up, then there are certain things you do. If the market is in an obvious trend, as I often preach, if you could draw a big blue arrow on the chart and it's up or down, then if it's down, you need to be short or shorting or just sitting on your hands and out of the market. If it's up, then you need to be long and not short. And, of course, the one that we often forget about, which 2015 taught us yet another lesson between uh, late 2014 up until just recently, sometimes when it's sideways, unless you think you have the mother of all setups, there's not much to do. Now, if you're a trend follower, and by the way, the only way to profit from a trade is to catch a trend, then you must have to wait and possibly miss part of the move. And the reason I'm saying that is because in last week's week of charts, we had uh, the S&Ps looking like this, and it dropped, and then it's pulled back a little bit. And it seems that... The big question mark is, is it just going to go back on to make new highs? And I don't know. I mean, the signals are there. It looks like it wants to do this. It looks like it wants to roll back over. Okay, that's what I'm thinking so far until proven otherwise. But some of the people, or I don't remember if it was more than one, were like, well, Dave, if it goes back up, you know, we're going to miss from here to here. And I'm like, so what? And like Jim said, Am I hearing you correctly? Would this thing have to go on and make new highs? Okay, little check mark there. That's supposed to be a check mark. Before I would start getting bullish or start looking to play the long side as a general statement. I mean, obviously, if you get the mother of all setups, regardless of market conditions, you take it. Right now, we got one we're looking at that looks kind of interesting. And, um, but I'm not excited about rushing out and buying a whole lot of stocks at this juncture. And I'll talk a little bit about what longs you should be in, uh, given the condition of the market. 
so the bottom line is you have to remember if you are a trend follower you have to be willing to to possibly miss part of the move you have to wait so you have to obviously wait for a trend before you could follow that trend and i know it it it, it sounds kind of silly but it's very it's true and then you know being in the american association of professional technical analysts is it's helped me kind of um wrap my head around some of these things it's so funny it's like you know, you know you've got all these smart individuals doing all this complex stuff but what i get out of it is usually the simplest stuff of all and so from people like greg where he just talks about you have to have a trend before you can follow it and and Greg is right. It's you have to have a trend. So, so so what if you miss that first little move? Now I have transitional patterns or emerging trend patterns, which we often talk about. They're a little bit more trickier to trade, and like the pioneers, like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the gold or you get the arrows in the back. But the chances of getting the gold make it all worthwhile. The chance of getting the gold makes it all worthwhile. So those are a little early trend patterns. I get more questions on those than all of my other patterns combined. And we're going to take a look at some of those in just one second. So you have to have a trend before you could follow the trend. And I know it's, it's the longer I'm in this industry, the, the more easy, ah, I use the word easy. I should say simple, the more simple I begin to see things. It's kind of like um, I, I quoted him in my – yeah, I'm so bad about misquoting people <laughs> or giving them credit. But uh, Tom McClellan in his column quoted um, someone I wrote about it two columns ago. If you, if you go on my, uh, on my, on my uh, website, you can see it in the archives. But it's, but it's like uh, he's a southerner, and he was at a conference, and he was asked about, you know, well, how do you know it's a trend? How do you know it's a trend? He says, well, you just kind of got to look at the chart and says, is you is or is you isn't in a trend? and there's a lot of truth to that. It's kind of like the the line he used to, used to say for Linda Rasky. I used it so much, people sort of quoted me on it, and uh, it was actually Linda. It's like if, you, if you're not sure if a chart's in a trend, ask a six-year-old kid because a six-year-old kid doesn't care if it's going up or down. And I don't want to digress too far, as I know, but I tend to go off on rants. It's like uh, I've been thinking a lot recently, and it's probably something I'm going to talk about uh in my traders expo i only had 30 minutes to teach trading and uh i had a kid come to the house about a year ago and he was at a stock picking deal with his school and he was failing miserably and i gave him a set of very simple rules to follow and i said this is what you do and this is all you do and he could really care less he just fell in love with a girl at that time and you know he just wanted he could care less about school so all he did was the bare minimum of what I told him to do, which was pretty simple, by the way. I just told him that he couldn't buy a stock unless it was making a new high. And he said, well, every now and then a teacher makes us sell stocks. What do, we, what do I do then? He, I said, well, you can't sell any stock that's a winner. You can only sell a stock that's a loser. And he went from second in the class to second in class over the next few weeks. And I think he finished in the top – couple overall um he's once he got out of class he I, i've been trying to track him down and he's he's not interested in me anymore he was just interested in getting some information to pass the class and that was it uh it doesn't always work that great but it just goes to show you i think that is sort of a uh, i don't know if a microcosm is the right word to use but it's a good example it's a good little antidote of what can happen when you don't give a flip and you just follow your rules and i don't want to get into the trading psychology too much now but if you do have a set of rules and you follow those rules, and again, like I said earlier, excuse me, maybe it is following those rules more mechanically than you think. You should do fine longer term. But sometimes it means that you might just have to wait around. So if you want to know the secret to trading, there's a few things you need to know. First of all, you're not going to catch every zig and zag. If you did, you would own the world in about a month, okay? You would own the markets. There would be no more markets. It would just be you, and that would be it. The markets would, would dissolve. 
So you're not going to catch every zig and zag. You're dealing with your own personal emotions, and you're trying to read the emotions of others. And there's a lot of participants out there. And to quote Tom McClellan's mother, Marion McClellan, and I hope I don't misquote her, um, she once said that people buy stocks for a variety of reasons. Some people or people trade for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And some people use far more sophisticated methods. So there's no way you could look at a chart and know exactly what all those people are going to do. Last week or week before, someone asked me, well, Dave, you keep talking about this overhead supply, which I'm going to beat the dead horse in that in a few minutes again this week. And the question was, well, how do you know everyone hasn't sold? Well, you don't know everyone hasn't sold. You're not God, okay? You just trade when you have an edge or perceived edge, I should say, and let the chips fall where they may. So you're not going to catch every zig and zag, especially if you're a trend follower or any other type of trader to, for that matter. But let's just focus on trend following because that's how we roll. You're going to have to wait for that trend to either emerge, okay, or um, I guess resume. So sometimes you do have to wait. And I think this is the secret, the biggest secret of all. The first secret of trading is there is no secret, okay? Uh, it's pretty much like everything else in the world. It's hard work. Uh, it's not nearly as complex as people make it, but the psychological aspects of it do make it difficult to do. I think you could follow a set of rules and a lot of other things, and it's not going to be that hard to do to be successful. I'm doing some home construction now. There are some general rules you follow. These uh, idiots before me never did. Um, like the sewer drain drains the wrong way. You know, it's like, okay, well, obviously it's got to drain down. Otherwise, because the, the stuff doesn't roll up the hill, right? <laughs> anyway, you have a set of, of rules. And in trading, it's no different. There are a set of general rules you follow. But being able to follow those rules is a lot more difficult. And in, in, in life, and I don't want to digress too far, but you're not going to – you're not going to set a drain going the wrong way just because you're, 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 that's your attitude on that day and you don't care because obviously there's going to be a repercussion from that. But at trading, you might not honor your stop because you hope it comes back or you hope something will change, and there's, there's a lot of mistakes you will make. But there really are no secrets to trading other than sometimes you just have to wait. And, and I think that's the biggest secret of all. And I keep coming back to this. And 2015, again, was that kind of market where I bored my clients to death saying, we need to stay out of this market, stay out of this market, stay out of this market. And then the market crashes or somewhat crashes. It's kind of like, you know, I told you. It's like they, it's, there's, the conditions were not conducive. So you sit on your hands. And it was pretty nice. And I don't want to brag because I get my ass handed to me on more occasions that I care to admit. I made some mistakes overnight and some things, and I'm a little pissed off today. But I'm channeling that energy to make that a positive. So you will make mistakes, and that's okay. But you definitely want to trade when the odds are stacked in your favor. It was interesting, and this is what, uh, uh, and again, I, I, it's one thing I was worried about in this presentation because – I do want to talk a little bit about Mark and some of these other um, people out there. And uh, it's, I worry that I'm name dropping some, sometimes, but I just, I just, I just, I know all these people. If you're, if you're in the industry long enough and you survive, which many don't, by the way, then you'll, you'll get to know all these people. And it's a wonderful thing. And there's some wonderful people in this industry. But uh, Larry McMillan was talking at one of the APTA conferences about uh, we were on a break and we, we got to talking about Curtis Facebook and uh, we were talking a little bit about trend following and sometimes you have to wait for a trend to follow and you wait for your signals, wait for your setups, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Larry was started talking about that. He goes, well, have you read that book? And it's like, and eh, those turtle books came out and um, I, I never really bothered reading them. And he says, oh, you got to read the one by Curtis Faith. It's at the least it's entertaining. And it's uh, it's called the way of the turtle. And it's it's a it's an entertaining it's a good book and there's there's some things to be gleaned 
from that book. And I think one of the most important things was these guys were sitting around waiting for signals and they had nothing to do. So one of them had a brilliant idea and said, let's get a ping pong table. And these guys actually became pretty good at ping pong. I think they were, uh, it's been a while since I read the book, but, but they were probably at a, a semi-professional uh, level. And they actually had ping pong tournaments when there was nothing to do. They either pl were playing ping pong or they were having tournaments. They were, they were, they were finding a way to keep themselves occupied while they waited for signals. And I just thought that was a really cool thing. So get yourself a ping pong table. I guess you need a partner, though. You know, that's the only problem. Um, or like I, I kind of mentioned right before the show started, keep yourself busy. I, I, It's almost a sickness with me. Uh, it drives my wife uh, crazy, which is a short trip, but uh, that's another story. Anyway, uh, no, babe, I love you. I'm just joking, as far as you know. It's like if I'm sitting around and she's watching TV or whatever, it's like – if I'm on, even if I'm on my laptop working or whatever in front of the TV, it's like my leg is moving or shaking or whatever. I'm always like, I have to be moving. I have to be doing something. And that can be a curse when it comes to trading. And that's why I keep myself so busy. That's why I'm doing a webinar right now. I do webinars every week. I write, I do um, videos and all this other stuff. I just do a lot of stuff to keep me busy because if I'm just sitting here, I can guarantee you I'll start firing off trades when I shouldn't. And that's just human nature. It, it is what it is. The can't stand it test. I need to find a better way of talking about this or wording it. But I remember back in 2000 when I was trying to finish up Dave Landry on swing trading. And the market had turned and was selling off. And I was still trying to, I guess I think I was still trying to fight the last battle or, or, or trade the last war. And I, I was probably too biased to the long side, and, and I began losing money. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm so busy writing this book, and I'm losing money trading anyway because I'm not following my rules, and, and I seem to be making mistakes. So I began to back off on the trading. And one thing I found in doing that by working on the books, I was still looking at the markets. I mean, obviously, it's something I do. but I found myself saying, okay, there's really not any opportunities anyway. I'm not going to do anything. Let me get back to the book. And then it reached a point where it was like, it was almost like this um, epiphany. It's kind of like, wait a minute, this is this looks like a good setup. I, th I think I need to take this setup. So I took the setup. And then instead of micromanaging myself out of it and watching it, un watching it every little tick and everything unfold, I'd go back to working on the book and then be like, okay, well, let's just, just let it go. It's doing fine. And it really, it really helped to cement these rules and for me to follow my rules a lot better by keeping myself busy with the book. And it reached a point where I, I, it was the can't stand it test. It's like, I can't stand it. This, this setup looks so good. I have to take it. And I found myself saying, okay, well, you know, this looks kind of mediocre. Why bother? Especially this is going to distract me from this project if I take this trade, but if I couldn't stand it, if it was just like, it just looks so damn good. As Roger said, if it looked like there was money just lying in the corner and all I had to do was go over and pick it up, then I would take the trade. And that really kind of helped to, to get me a lot more disciplined in things as opposed to, it's almost like before I had to like make mistakes, correct them, get disciplined, Start making mistakes again, correct them, get disciplined. Not that I don't make mistakes. As I admitted earlier, I made mistakes overnight. But it was a fat figure type of situation. But that's okay. I mean, that, that's going to happen. That's the other thing that's got me thinking today is that you will make mistakes. You will do dumb things. But learn from them and live through them and just shake them off. And don't let them affect your next trade. But like Jimmy Rogers said, I just wait until there's money lying in the corner and all I have to do is go over and just pick it up. I do nothing in the meantime. And I forgot that part of that quote. Because I'm always quoting the first half of this quote when I quote Jimmy Rogers. And by the way, I don't know Jimmy Rogers. So see, there's, there's a <laughs> um, – I'm sure I'll bump into him at some point. But I forgot about this part of the quote. I do nothing in the meantime. And 
this is what sometimes you do. Now, I'm going to talk about this in just a few minutes, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself again. Imagine that. But even though the market looks iffy in here, based on the number of days of the pullback at all, I'm not really seeing setups on the short side. So what am I going to do? Well, I, you know, it's like I want to be short. I think the market's going rolling over, especially a little bit longer term on a longer term basis. But I don't have any setups that I really like. So it's kind of tough when you think the market's going to do something, but you don't really have anything to do. But that's the right thing to do. So I love that. Uh, I do nothing in the meantime. I'm retired. She is always here. <laughs> Get a wife. Keep your life busy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're remodeling a bathroom now. And, uh, um, oof, it's killing us. <laughs> you should relate to Jimmy Rogers. He is from nowhere, Alabama. Yeah, he's, uh, I'm in Louisiana. He's in Alabama. Those, those southern, southerners tend to stick together. Get a wife. She'll keep you busy. Amen to that. I'm retired. She's always here. My wife works from the house, so she's always here, too. Um, I thought the Reverend Dave was GD emissary. Huh? I don't I don't get it. Hey, Dave, I thought you called Forex and efficient. How can Forex be an efficient market? Roughly a four trillion dollar market by definition. It's efficient market. Oh, did I say any fish? I bet I bet efficient market. Forex is efficient market. But an efficient market can make an inefficient move in certain situations. So if you have like a bow tie off of 10-year lows or all-time lows in a currency or off of 10-year highs or ideally all-time highs in a currency, then that's a signal that you might want to take. Same thing goes, goes for any other. I think I did a Freudian slip. I said gold, but same thing. Yeah, gold, you, uh, oil, whatever. Uh, right now we're long, we're long oil. Why? Well, it's making a transition off of major, major lows. We might be wrong. We could always be wrong. But even though it's a super duper efficient market, it's a signal that you're almost forced to take. Okay, so sometimes even in efficient markets like gold and oil, you're forced to take. Such signals. By the way, I have some special report, at least one special report on uh, efficiency, and it's on the website. Also, read the GoGo Dobo report, and that talks a lot about efficiency and when you should actually trade efficient stocks. Okay. Do not eat the head or tall feathers of the sardine. Do not eat the head or the, you don't eat the head of a sardine? I didn't know that. My kids are now watching. Ooh, I'm sorry, John. I wish I'd have read that before I said the, said the S word. <laughs> Sometimes you'll never hear me say the F word in here, and that F word is fundamentals. Great job in a special report you put on YouTube a couple of days ago. Thank you, John. Um, I do need to work on my videos a little bit. Uh, my studio is still kind of in a state of flux, but uh, – I'm getting there. The sound, I had to use the backup sound and all. I don't want to digress too far, but uh, those should only get better. And I've got a lot of things planned. I just need, I just need more time. <laughs> all right, let's talk about uh, sign signal setup. Sign signal setup trigger. This is something that we've been talking about quite a bit lately. Now, this is a weekly chart on the S&P 500. And... I kind of see signs as things like classical technical analysis type of patterns. And we, we got into a discussion, or we often get a discussion, on classical technical analysis and its use. And te classical technical analysis, Schaubacher, um, Edwards and McGee, And more modern classics, I guess, by Pring and Murphy, people like that, can be quite useful. And they do give you, I think, framework is kind of the word of the lesson today. But they do kind of give you a framework to work around. Maybe some structure is a good point. 
I like to see see things as an actual kind of like almost like a physical structure to the market when I use the word structure. And that's your signs. Let's say you got a big double top. That could be a sign of a top. Head and shoulders top. That could be a sign of a top. But you also need some sort of signal and or setup. And then, of course, a trigger. Now, if you're looking at things like bow ties, they're going to kind of set up in kind of like an inverted cup type of pattern. Not not going back to the going back past O'Neill, a cup set up going all way back to Edwards and McGee or Schaubacher and, and those guys. And then the pullback or the setup, which forms, let's say, a bow tie, could be like the more classics like uh, William O'Neill cup and handle. In this case, it would be an inverted cup and handle. So you have that big picture structure to work around. And then you have the setup and the signal and the trigger. So the sign here was that the market had lost some steam. It doesn't take a rocket surgeon to see that we were in a nice longer-term uptrend back here. You had a pullback on a weekly chart, kind of a TKO type of move back here. And then the market continued higher. So it was doing pretty good until – most of 2015, what happened? Well, it went sideways. And again, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a rocket surgeon to see that on a net-net basis it hadn't made any progress in a while. Now, this didn't mean that it's going down. It just means that it lost its upside momentum. Now, sometimes when a market consolidates, it could actually be building a base for a launch higher. And as I often say, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. And people or traders or investors, however you want to look at it, but let's just use the word traders. Traders don't tend to agree for long. Markets go from a state of equilibrium to a state of disequilibrium. And I think the term price discovery needs to kind of find its way into, into that phrase. Okay. So I guess through the price discovery mechanism – in other words, the market, when you have a market just kind of going back and forth, chopping back and forth sideways, traders are tending to agree upon price. And usually that doesn't happen for long. But the longer that happens, when the market does make a move, you end up with a disequilibrium. OK, now, again, this is I preach quite often. There's nothing magical about my way of, of reading the mind of the market, my way or my approach to the charts or technical analysis, however you want to look at it. I'm just trying to see the psychology, trying to understand the psychology of what's going on. When I see a base, I know a lot of people agree upon the stock. When I see it break out of the base and not come right back in, then I'm like, okay, well, these people in this range, they may be doing some things if it comes back to the range or if the market continues away from that range. So, and we'll talk about that in a little more in just one second. But we know we have this range. We know we have the sideways trading. We know we lost momentum. And if we didn't know anything, we could just draw a big blue arrow on the chart and see that the signs are suggesting a sideways base, a sideways consolidation, whatever you want to call that. Well, then we get this first thrust down, which also formed a bow tie. And I think everyone here knows what a bow tie is, but just in case, it's just a 10-day crossing, a 20-day crossing, a 30-day over a fairly short period of time, and it gives the appearance of a bow tie in the moving averages. Okay. I should have put my name on it. Like Bollinger was smart enough to put his my, – my, my, my mom. She, sometimes she acts like my mom. Uh, <laughs> My wife keeps telling me, where do you get to name a pattern after yourself? Become famous like Bollinger. It's like, I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's your signal is the bow tie. And then your setup is the when the market makes higher highs and higher lows. Because everything I do, if you had to boil it down within a nutshell or have you want to look at it, reduce it, is really a just trade to pullbacks. So we're looking for a thrust correction, thrust correction, thrust correction or a pullback, or reversion to the mean in the direction of the trend, if you like it, want to call it that, be fancy about it. 
But a pullback means the market has to pull back. In other words, in a downtrend, it has to make higher lows and higher highs. And so that gives us the setup. So again, the sign is that the market lost steam. The signal is that the moving average has crossed over. And then the setup is that the market pulls back. Now, I've been Mr. Bear lately. I even wrote a column yesterday called the Dead Bull. That doesn't mean that the market can't go back up. The market can do whatever it wants. I'm just seeing signs, setups, and signals, or signs, signals, and setups that suggest otherwise. Now, unless they trigger, then there's no harm done. Then it's kind of like, oh, we had a signal, we had a setup, but it didn't trigger. So what? I think some people get a little anxious in my trading service. Sometimes I'll show a stock day after day after day, and it doesn't trigger. And then I pull it off because it's no longer set up. That can happen quite often. Okay. That doesn't bother me because I'm like, okay, well, no capital was put into harm's way. We'll find something else. But I think some people get impatient and they see my trigger. I'll just pull a number out there. My trigger at 15 and the stock goes down to 12, 11, 10 or whatever. And they're thinking, well, they thought I was good at 15. So maybe it's even better at 10. So they'll buy it at 10, and then it goes to 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. And I get an email six months later, Dave, you recommended this stock. I've lost 80%. And it's like, well, geez, I don't even remember that one. So I go back in the archives. And it's like, what did I recommend that? And I go back and look at the chart. Oh, there it is right there. I see the nice little pull up, pull back, nice little setup, but it never did trigger. So that trigger thing, that's another one of those little secrets of trading is wait for that trigger. So in the S&P 500, getting back to Jim's question, I guess now I'm cautious, but I would be officially bearish and, and quite possibly quite short if we had a trigger. And that means if we took out this week's low or let's give it a little bit of wiggle rope just in case it fakes out. Let's say we take out last week's low or this low here. These are rolling bars, so it gets kind of confusing. Each bar is five days, so one bar can roll into the next. The calendar chart will look a little calendar weekly will look a little bit different than a rolling weekly i like a rolling weekly chart but it does make things confusing except uh on friday they all look the same um so tomorrow we're getting pretty cl close to an actual calendar chart hopefully that makes sense a calendar would be monday through friday as each bar and then a rolling would be last five days so right now this bar i guess will be thursday to thursday tomorrow it's going to be friday to friday or I guess Monday to Friday. This would be Friday to Thursday. Anyway, hopefully that makes sense. I don't want to digress too far into that. But anyway, you need signal setup and then the trigger. And trigger is key. You got to have the trigger. Now, let's get back to the overhead supply. And I'm not going to beat the head horse too much on this because we talked about this at nausea. I mean, I did the YouTube and everything. And again, nothing magical about looking at overhead supply. It's just an area where a lot of people have likely bought the market and they'll be looking to get out of break even uh someone asked last week it may have been jim how do you know if they haven't all sold number one you don't but number two this sell off and then you know we might not even count this day because that's just a, that's right to the bottom of the range but let's just count it one two three this whole slide happened in three days people aren't that fast to react okay so a lot of people who have likely bought in that range and are sitting, which sitting on the stocks, they didn't have time to get out. They probably were deer in the headlights, or as I often say with overhead supply, it's possible they didn't even notice it right away until that third or fourth day. And then by then, the market started going back up. So they're like, oh, maybe we dodged a bullet. Well, it's when it makes that new leg down, or if I should say, I don't want to. I want to sound like it's a. What's the French? Fait to complete, like it's a done deal. Cast in stone, and we're going down. I hope it goes straight back up. Okay. Somebody told me last week, stop, stop apologizing for being bearish. All right, I'm I gonna quit. You know, it is what it is. You, you always. I worked with a hedge fund for many, many years, and with the, with the the guy told me was he said he said other partners in the past he says you might not be right he goes but at least you know where you stand and that that was the biggest one of the biggest compliments i've ever received and and, and 
and I've taken that ball and, and ran with it, it's kind of like, so Dave, what do you think about the markets? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think, and I'm going to stick to that until proven otherwise. I'm not going to get obstinate. And if it's just going sideways, I'm going to let the people who count waves or count individual price bars and have some sort of a, or look at the moon and the sun and when Mercury's in retrograde or whatever. And um, I'm going to let those guys figure out where the market's going because to me, when the market's going sideways, the market's going sideways. As I often preach, unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. And anyway, based on all those different things, I think the market's still in trouble. We have a mountain of overhead supply. So far, we worked our way back up towards it, especially like in the NASDAQ, which we'll look at in just one second. But there's a chance that these people, a, a better than average chance, that these people might be looking to get out of break even. So between 2050 and 2125 or thereabouts, the market's going to have a really hard time and will likely encounter some resistance. And that's just technical analysis. 101. You know, I've been thinking a lot about Mark lately, Mark Douglas. I'm really bummed out. Um, you know, I often I, I tell a story almost every week, and, and a story is like uh, you have to learn how to be wrong, and you have to learn how to get some bad trades out the way. Somebody asked me last week, well, what if we have five losing trades in a row? And it's like, well, that's possible. That's That's very possible. But learn from that experience and there's a couple things well maybe conditions are changing and you have to get those maybe those five bad trades will be necessary and it is what it is um as long as you do a post-mortem on those five bad trades and in perfect hindsight you could say and in perfect honesty you could say yeah that sure looked like money lying in the corner and it flat out didn't work and i try not to get too excited sometimes about setups in the trading service because it sounds like it's going to work, but I mean, there, there are times when I just, I get excited, my pulse quick as I get all excited. I'm like, oh God, this setup looks fantastic. And I just, it just kind of, they just kind of jump off the charts at me. Not that hasn't happened much lately, but it happened a little bit last year, late last year. And we had a few that turned out to work out uh, pretty good since then. But no matter how great the setup looks, well, there's still a chance for failure. So make sure your stock selection is, is 100%, okay? Make sure you're 100% on that. Make sure your your buddy and position management is also 100%, meaning that you're giving them enough wiggle room to breathe, as I say quite often. A lot of times I've fixed a lot of people just by having them open up their stops a little bit. Your stops cannot be within that normal volatility. I've beat the dead horse quite a bit on that. But getting back to the Douglas story, um, it, one of his cassette tapes I have here, that's, I'm dating myself. Most of you probably would I'd show you that what cassette tape. You'd be like, what's this thing? <laughs> this cassette thing. It looks funny. It has a, some weird stuff in there. What is that? It looks like a tape, but it, one of the cassettes I have from him, he said that, um, the difference between a good salesman and a bad salesman is a bad salesman makes a few bad calls and goes out and drinks his lunch. A good salesman goes get a breath of fresh air, goes grab a cup of coffee after a few bad calls, and he knows that the good calls are statistically just right around the corner. So um, so you're going to be wrong a lot. Get used to it, and it's okay to get the bad trades out of the way. So I'm really bummed out about Mark. I don't want to talk about it too much because it it it, it will it does upset me, uh, and I'm just really bummed out. Um the only thing I want to say, like I said, the column, it's like early in my career, he had a really big impact on me because um, it just it just was hard. It, it, trading could be really hard at times. And, um, you know, having somebody write about psychology makes you feel like, well, I can work through this. I could do this because there are times when when. From a psychological standpoint, you'll feel like you'd be better off flipping burgers, okay? Now, you're going to feel less and less like that with time, and once you start following your rules, and once you wrap your head around this, and once you know that you have to deal with your own psychological demons or issues, however you want to look at it. And the other thing to remember, too, is, and this is, I have these little epiphanies in doing these webinars, and that's why I love doing them so much from a selfish standpoint, is that... 
if it weren't for the emotions of the other players and this write this down this is important if they if it weren't for the emotions of the other players you would not be able to make money in markets to be able to trade because what you're doing is you're trying to capitalize on the emotions of others while keeping yours in check and that's another secret of trading anyway mark uh, we're gonna miss you buddy um, all right, let's. Um, I, I really, I, you know, I didn't. I don't think Mark and I met in person, but you know, not to name drop again, but it seems like if you're in this business long enough, you get to meet everyone. And uh, we talked a few times on the phone, and I think we were. Um, it, it's been so long. It was probably back in 2000, back in the trading markets days. And I, I'm, I don't know if we were on projects together or anything materialized, but uh, he was a super nice guy. He really was. He just was a good guy. Anyway, um, right now, setups, some random thoughts. Setups are really hard to find in spite of the market. It's just too many days of the pullback. The market just kept pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. And on a short side, this is what you want to see ideally. You want to see a market sell off, that signal or whatever. And the setup, within a couple of days, you want to just see a couple of days of pullback. And the reason being is because... At this juncture here, day one or day two, however you want to look at it, let's just say two days, these people are thinking like, okay, well, maybe the market's coming back. I'm just going to sit on my hands and not dump my position. And if that market pulls back just one or two days and then, bam, begins to sell off, then it's like these traders are caught off guard. Same thing works on, works on the upside, too. With the transitional pattern, ideally, I'm a little bit more lenient on, on the transitional patterns because sometimes the bottom takes a little time. But ideally, you want to see that, that pattern, that setup, the signal, the setup, I should say, setup. I don't want to confuse you too much. The setup. You want to see that setup trigger within a couple of days because that's going to catch the most people off guard. And right now, we're not, we don't have that. So nothing much has changed as far as the market itself, by the way. Uh, again, not to be dead, dead horse, a lot of overhead supply, weekly bow tie, first thrust down. On a daily, weekly chart, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and then, of course, the death cross. Uh, again, I've kind of beat the dead horse or beat the dead bull <laughs> quite a bit on all these things. If you go back and watch the um, – I did a short update uh, on last week's week of charts. And check that out on, um, on YouTube. We get a chance. Now, so what do we do? Well, this is the same thing I said last week. It probably the week before. It's what you always do. You honor your stops. And in this particular case, let's say on any leftover longs, we got stopped out of everything on the long side. And what's interesting is, and it doesn't always unfold like this, but this is a testament for using stops, following your plan, having that if-then framework in place. But by doing so, we've got slowly and almost methodically and systematically, and it, well, I'm not saying it was fun, but we got stopped out of the longs, most of which were at profit. So I always look at getting stopped out of the profit a little bit differently than to get stopped out of the loss. Okay. And that's one of the things that was in uh, the Curtis Faith book. I think Dennis uh, looked at, Richard Dennis looked at drawdowns to open profits differently than he, he looked at the losses that traders made. So if a trader was losing money uh, that he made, uh, losing some of those open profits, he was a little bit more. Uh, favorable, or he didn't look down upon that because he knew it was a fact of life. Uh, read that book to get a chance, by all means. Now, on the long side, you want to be super selective. You want to seek out inefficiencies. We're looking at one stock right now that's going pretty much straight up in spite of the overall market and then just has recently corrected over the last couple of days. So that stock has proved that it might be inefficient. It, it, it might be able to trade contrary to the overall market. Not so much trade contra to the overall market, because the trade contra to the overall market, that's more like commodity-related stocks, which I'll mention here in just one second. But uh, let's just say able to ignore the market, and it's inefficient. Um, seek out stocks that can trade contra to the overall market would mean uh, metals and mining, gold, silver, steel. I'm seeing some steel and irons begin to look like they're trying to set up, look like they're bottoming out. Wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet with both fists, but keep an eye on them. 
Also, right now, the energies have been beaten up. We are long USO. Getting a little exposure there. Um, it hasn't really worked swimmingly just yet, although yesterday was a pretty good day. Pretty good start. Could be the resumption of that emerging trend. And then take a look at like XOP. We'll take a look at it in one second. But XOP, uh, I think that's the drillers. Those, or that's the ETF for the drillers. Looks like it's trying to bottom out it here. We have the, I think we, we are sort of in a sign phase there. We have we don't have the bow tie. We don't have the signal. We don't have the setup. But we're kind of in a sign phase. It's beginning to kind of go sideways, beginning to bottom out. So what might be a beautiful thing is that even if the market begins to tank a little bit, Maybe we could still buy some of these commodity-related stocks and do okay. Now, you don't buy them just for the sake of buying them because so far they're still headed lower. But as I said in the last YouTube I did on the market update, it's a process, and that process might take a few more weeks or it might take a few more months. And again, it comes back to the waiting thing. Uh, the OB would have tried to just catch that bottom, okay? But now it's like, I'm just going to wait. And so what if I miss some of that initial move? That's what trend following is. And then obviously, again, not to beat to that horse, but on your stops when triggered. Short side, same thing. Be super duper selective. And right now we're not seeing many setups. Okay. And then you also want to find stocks that are at high levels versus those that are in longer term downtrends. Right now the energies look like this. And some might still be setting up, okay? But that's what the energies look like. And everything else, uh, except for metals and mining, which looks more like the energies, kind of looks like this. So I think your big opportunity would be from there down to there and not from here down to here, okay? And that's just the way I look at shorts as a general statement. And as a general statement, too, I tend to match the pattern to the market. So... If the market's rolling over, I tend to like stocks that are also rolling over like the overall market as opposed to stocks that are already in established downtrends. And then again, beating a dead horse, wait for entries and honor your stops once triggered. Okay. This is actually from – this is not for um, – this is actually for another presentation I did, but uh, it's all – Available, like I said earlier, I have special reports on the website. Usually, there's a banner ad on my site for that. If not, just go to the store. And uh, I mentioned stock selection, by the way. Uh, you can go to the store and check out the stock selection course while you're there. And I'm feeling kind of generous. Uh, I woke up in a bad mood, and I recognized that I was in a bad mood. And I said, you know what? You got to get out of that bad mood and get over it. Um, so since I'm now in a good mood, especially since I started the show, uh, if you get the course, I'll give you a year free to my trading service. So just um, just say, hook me up, dude, or give me an email, and I'll make sure that happens. Ciao dall'Italia, Dave. Ciao from Italy, Dave. Ah, well, hello, Gabrielli. Mark Douglas, Mark Douglas liked discipline. Boy, it's 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 hard to for me to um, to use these things in the past contents. Mark Douglas liked discipline and checklists. Get a process that works and stick with it. Amen, Phil. Amen. Okay, uh, you guys can go ahead and open up. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up for individual stocks. I think I've covered the market in a lot of details already. Let me just highlight a few things, and then we'll. Um, We'll clean out the questions, and then we'll go to the uh, – or I'll answer the questions. And then we'll hop into uh, individual stock picks. So if any individual stock picks you want me to talk about, feel free to do that. My only request, just for your benefit, is that ask about a stock, then hit enter. Or carriage return, as I sometimes call it. And at, you can ask about as many as you want. But if you ask about 10, it's very hard for me to, to figure out which ones I've already covered. All right, uh, S&P 500 so far just kind of pulling back, okay? And what you got to realize is I think a lot of people are seeing this. They're saying, oh, it's going up, okay? Well, never forget about the net debt change. So go back to – my eyes are pretty bad here, getting bad. So we got two and a half weeks, two weeks of change of sideways trading on our net debt basis. So it really hasn't done anything. But, yeah, if you go back to the lows, it's a pullback from those lows. 
And again, blah, blah, blah. There's a mountain of overhead resistance. Someone's sick of talking about that. Same sort of action at NASDAQ. A little bit more exacerbated. It's moved higher. You can see, though, it's approaching this 4,900 where it, it should, not necessarily will, it should run into uh, some, some problems. Like the, um, I wonder who the actual trader was. Does anybody know there was a floor trader that wanted to come off the floor and um, some punk kid was teaching him technical analysis and he said, uh, soybeans will stop here because that's where support is. And he says, uh, really? He says, oh, yeah, yeah, that'll stop right there. That'll stop. He says, okay. So he called the floor and says, uh, what would it take to uh, what would it take to push soybeans below this um, this area? And he says, a million. And the guy says, at the market. <laughs> so, and then, of course, the market began to implode. Um, you know, that, that reminds me of uh, what Douglas said, too. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep channeling Douglas here because he's, he says a lot of uh, good things. And Douglas once said, all it takes is one a-hole to screw up a perfectly good trade. And I know you've heard all these stories time and time again, but I'm, I'm going to keep telling them until you get it. So, you know, let's say you were long soybeans down at that support, and this guy was just trying to make a point, okay, and he, and he made the market crack. So in that case, he was the a-hole, <laughs> you know. So you just have to wrap your head around the fact that there's a lot of participants and they buy and sell for a lot of reasons. And sometimes they will take you out with them. OK. All right. Let's take a look. Great questions coming. in. I can't wait to get to them. So let me just hurry through this uh, sector analysis. There's really not much to say other than just throw a dart at them. And most look like the overall market itself have sold off hard and, and retraced. The only thing I want to point out that I'm beginning to see, especially on an individual issue basis in the foods, is that I am seeing some strength in the foods. And then if you take a look at like tobacco, tobacco is kind of strong in here too, at least shorter term. And I don't view that as a positive. What concerns me is that when you have these shifts over to defensive issues, defensive issues like uh, consumer non-durables and foods, tobaccos. People are still going to smoke in a bear market. People are still going to take drugs in a bear market. People are going to still use personal products in a bear market, right? So that's a theory. The theory is there's always a bull market somewhere. Well, as I wrote Laban's, you know, it's kind of like I think like, uh, what was the, the line of Caddyshack? No, you don't, Danny, or no, you won't, Danny. You know, it's like you won't always have a bull market somewhere. Some of those areas in, in, in 2008, even the defensive, the so-called defensive areas were down well over 50%, like the overall market itself. So play them as long as they're there. It, it kind of reminds me, I, I wrote a column a while back when the market looked a little iffy and, and it didn't materialize, but it looked like a little iffy. And I got to thinking, it's kind of like how rats leave a ship, okay? So those speculative issues are first to go. So I keep a list of, of 100 momentum stocks, and in those 100 momentum stocks, it's a wonderful exercise, by the way. And every day when I do it, I think, geez, you know, is this really worth my while doing this? And I'm like, the answer is yes, because I'm able to see where the money's flowing, where the money's going. But there's these little nuances that have come from this project that I started a few years ago. And the nuances are that – the list gets whacked right before the market gets whacked. And that's because those go-go stocks are the first to go. They they get cleaned out quickly. So those momentum stocks, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And that tends to happen first. And then it was kind of interesting. It's kind of like the they seem to be like a move towards the defensive issues. And that's what's kind of got me a little scared, more than excited now is that if the market does roll over, you're going to get long those defensive issues and then, damn it, pardon my French, <laughs> as far as my French friend used to say, Dave, that's English, uh, they're going to roll over too. So um, if you do a search on that column, maybe it'll come up. Maybe I need to rewrite that column. So most areas look like the overall market. Defensive issues are improving. Um, and then the last thing I have to say, then we'll get to your, your questions. Keep them coming is that the obviously the energies and metals and mining, as I've said quite a bit, they just look a little sold out longer term. 
And again, it might be a process more than an event. Obviously, the big blue arrow is still pointing down. I'm not saying rush out and buy them. But what I am saying is they are beginning to bottom out a little bit based on the fact that they're kind of just sideways in here over the past, past month or so. So they could be bottoming out. And I'm beginning to see some, some buy setups or certainly some signs and bottoming action and some individual issues especially the more speculative beat up type of stocks. It seems like that's kind of an interesting phenomenon that when that it's like the big, um, what would be a good word for it? More efficient stocks and um, well-known, more uh, solid companies, for lack of a better word, or going to tend to be, um, kind of like the last to start rising in a situation like this. It's like the speculative issues. And I don't know why that is. Uh, it's something that, that maybe it's, it's uh, fodder for some uh, additional research. But when you start seeing these little speculative issues beginning to turn, you, you, you begin to wonder if, if the less speculative issues or more are, are beginning to turn to the overall sector. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's get rid of the questions first and then we'll get to individual stocks. Uh, Dave, do you ever get concerned with sentiment? No, because how can you really gauge sentiment, okay? I don't even know. I, I think I know what I'm going to have for lunch, but I might change my mind between now and then. So even if you did have a survey, what are the chances of people changing their mind? I, I don't know. Uh, and here's the other thing, too. In a longer-term uptrend, everyone is going to be most bullish, in a longer-term downtrend, everyone's going to be most bearish. Well, they're going to be most bullish or most bearish for a long, 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 long time. So if I can't use something to time a market, I throw it out. And I, I think something like sentiment looks good on paper logically it makes a lot of sense feels good oh yeah let's the percent of bullish people are at 98 percent. this is the highest it's ever been well if you sold the market every time it did that i think you'd be selling the big blue arrow while it's pointing straight up and i think that's a bad idea so uh second party question is Advisor sentiment currently very bearish or looking for correction. Do you consider sentiment indicators or just news noise that ultimately gets reflected in price? Yeah, Richard, the second half of your um, your answer to your question, second half, ignore it. All right, Don says, Mark was a great guy. I met him and spent an afternoon with him when we lived in Chicago. I talked to his wife the other day. Mark was 66 and very active in senior hockey. He had come home and laid down for a nap and passed. Not sick at all. Just went to check up and was okay. I miss him too, Dave. Yeah, Don, we're we're uh, he's a good guy. And you know, what's surprisingly, is how many people knew him. Uh, I'm getting uh, tons and tons of emails. Uh, my buddy Quint Tatro. He's like, I had lunch with him last week or week before. You know, it's like, wow. It's like it, it, I just I'm amazed at how many people knew Mark. Uh, so another testament for what a great guy he was. All right, Dave, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dave, it's not a show. Uh, we are seeing rising wedges or ascending triangles on a lot of the indices. Thanks. Um, I'm not really into triangles, it, it, at least not wedges in the term of wedges. The only wedge I kind of look for would be like if you have an uptrend and then you have like a rising kind of shorter term little, little um, I guess I call it a bear flag when it looks like that. That's the only thing that concerns me sometime. Um, I see this as just a deep retracement, a deep pullback in the indices, uh, kind of a almost gatekeeper looking, like my gatekeeper pattern, where you have kind of like a reverse check mark. So I just see that as thrust a deep retracement into a mountain of overhead supply. Uh, I know some people are looking at triangles and things like that, but that doesn't, I don't get into that kind of analysis. Triangles doesn't really. Uh, excite me that much. I, I think what you have to do, and I've seen some bloggers, one day they're writing about triangles, one day they're writing about bow ties, one day they're writing about oscillators, one day they're writing about Fibonacci. It's like, I think you have to find 
I don't want to say too narrow, but I think you have to find a fairly narrow sect and stick with it. And for me, it's pullbacks, okay? And for others, it might be something else. And then I think if you're going to use that classical technical analysis, as I said earlier, as signs, then make sure you combine it with something because I don't think you can rush out and trade head and shoulders. But if you get a head and shoulder and the right side forms a gatekeeper or a bow tie or a first thrust or whatever pattern or setup you like and love, then by all means, take the setup, okay? Take the shot. Will the infamous Fed decision today be enough for a trade change? I don't know. In bonds and then into markets if they raise to follow the history of interest rates, interest moves. Um, I don't know. I mean, a, a lot of people like to just have to rip it off like a band-aid, get it done. Uh, bonds looking a little sorry in here. It looks like they want to go back to the old lows. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you could, that's just spec. You could, that's speculation <laughs> at its best. Warden's version 7 is the only program that I know that uses the last five days. The other programs have different methods, each different style. Oh, really? So Stock Finder and TC2000 version 12 or whatever? Uh, huh. I kind of like the rolling calendar days. You know, it makes it confusing for everyone when I'm trying to teach technical analysis, but I, I kind of like the rolling days. I've been listening to an interview... Mark Douglas did on 21. He sounded great from what happened, just came out of the blue. Yeah, that's what everybody says. It's kind of like a, everybody's, everybody's in kind of a shock over this. Uh, I think he had a lot of good um, – I mean, I think he was just kind of hitting his stride, which is kind of like a – that's a bummer. Anyway. All right, Ojin for Andre. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, and, you know, like I said, it was relevant for me because I was just um, – I keep um, – I'm sitting in front of six screens, and a lot of times I'll put on YouTubes uh, while I work. And, and um, lately I've been listening to a lot of um, – and I, I earmarked a bunch of them just recently. I just and just recently watching Mark. Um, you know, and good to see him, uh, you know, keeping up the good fight and all. Uh, no, uh, this doesn't really do anything for me because – let's clean up the chart a little bit. Um it's just sideways in here. So where is it now, and where was it uh, about a month ago? How many times I have to tell you? I do a chart show every Thursday. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. So it's it's sideways. I would. It's just there's no pattern here. There's no setup. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. Uh. Hi, Dave. Cinema gives you a clue to potential of the next rally, but certainly doesn't let, let you know would that rally restart one week, six months. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with that kind of analysis is is that you can't – if you can't time a market on it, then I throw it out, okay? So the, the, the other thing – and again, this gets back to reducing everything. If you try to watch everything – you're going to end up with analysis paralysis. So if you're not going to buy stocks because the sentiment's at 99% or whatever percent is significant, then you're going to miss a lot of stock rallies because the market could do whatever it wants. So to me, it, without getting into the imperfect, imperfect nature of such a survey, um, and you know how you know people aren't lying in this survey, you know? Again, that's why I guess I said I wasn't going to get into the perfect nature, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, UA, if it pulls back to 100 for art. Uh, no, no, because you've got this V shaped recovery uh, in here. Now, this one is on my momentum list because it may do highs yesterday, and it could be headed higher. But my only concern now, and this is where it's going to get a little tricky, is that you have this V-shaped recovery, although it doesn't look at like it when with the chart looking like that. So it's kind of already overbought by the time it gets up here. I don't know. I think it's going to have to really clean this, clean, clear this range decisively uh, before it pulls back. I mean, absolutely keep that on your momentum list, but I wouldn't take action on that for a while. We'll see. 
you know, see if it can follow through. And let's see what the correction looks like. But I'd like to see it clear the um, clear this uh, range decisively. Some of Mark and Linda's old videos are on uh, a TV Iron Loom for free. All right. Uh, do me a favor, Michael. Uh, shoot me an email on that so I can stick it in my um, in my Evernote uh, and check them out. E-Link, E-L-N-K. Okay. Um, this this is like sign signal setup, but you've got sign and, and I don't think you've set up just yet. It looks like a big head and shoulders to me. And if you look at it's just going sideways forever, rounded kind of, uh, not so much a rounded top, but kind of a V top, head and shoulders. If anything, I think this could be a short. I wouldn't rush out and short it, but it looks like a top. So wait for the uh, thing. LGF, you're welcome, Steve. LGF. Yeah, you got this uh, crazy bar in here, uh, but the market was kind of nuts on that day, so I guess we could give it a pass. Uh, if it follows through, maybe on a pullback because it's 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 breaking out of its base. And some some of these stocks, I mean, this is something you need to look at. Some of these stocks are doing well. Art, that's uh, that is the setup for today, so I can't talk about that one. But yeah, good, you uh, you figured it out. Good job. <laughs> It shouldn't be too hard because there's not a whole lot of setup. Matt wants to know about IBKR. Um, this one I was bearish on about a week or two ago, but now it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 20, or 20 something days. So it's got a month of sideways action. And that's the tricky part about this market. You know, take a look at like spiders. Uh, the market has pulled back so many days, it just makes it difficult to um, to do anything. Ciao, Dave. Uh, can we see the ticker, Matt? Thanks. Sure. Uh, this stock, I usually don't get too excited about Mattel. Um, it's in a longer term downtrend, but just kind of, bottoming out of here and sideways, but there's really nothing to get excited about uh, just yet. Let's take a look at the, um, my charts, are my my bow ties don't uh, come in anymore. I've got to fix the um, the setup, but no, it's, it did, on top of that, you have a mountain of overhead supply right here. So, uh, le parlo, parlay. Inglese, VVUS, you must really be good if you can understand my Cajun accent. <laughs> um, this one has been catching my eye, but again, I, I like to seek perfection in charts, and I guess it's far enough away to where you could get a trade-off. HV is kind of crazy at 94. Not that I won't trade a, an HV of 94 stock. Sometimes you get like a... What was I thinking? Oh, uranium stock. I'm trying to think of the, the most speculative of all speculative stocks. I will have a, a super duper high HV. So the HV is high, and you got a mountain of overhead supply. I mean, I guess if I bought it at buck seventy five, and I'm flipping it out at uh, two and a quarter, that that wouldn't be a bad trade. But I like to set myself up for potential unlimited gains. So as a swing trade, it looks okay. I'll give you a good eye and a high five on that because it's made a big thrust higher. But the volatility is a little crazy, and the overhead supply would have me concerned. But, yeah, by all means, you know, um, a swing trade from a buck 80 to 220, uh, knock yourself out. I'm near – I'm in Italy near Genoa. I love Genoa. Genoa is uh, – and I speak not a good English. <laughs> well, I bet I speak even a worse Italiano. <laughs> Genoa was beautiful. Um, you know, when you're in Italy, no matter where the person is from, that's the most beautiful place, and you don't, you would never go anyplace else in, in Italy. So uh, my friends from Tuscany are like, oh, you don't want to go to Genoa. I got to Genoa. I'm like, wow, it's phenomenal over here. I love it. I love it. So great city. ACI. I loved it. Um, this is one, it's just a little too, it's another too crazy. Look, the HV is 300 
it kind of melted up from lows and then it came all the way back in. I think I would pass just because it's so crazy. Um, BTU was like another one did something very similar. James has been waiting patiently for BLD. Thank you, James. BLD. Yeah, this is one that's on my list, my momentum list that is. Um, maybe on a pullback, but good eye on that one. But it needs to pull back a little more. Howard says, FCX breaks over the 50, over 12. That's one we've been watching. Um, yeah, and this is the bottoming action that we're seeing in the uh, metals and the mining. So you want to put a 50-day moving average in there? Let's do that. Oh, what is that? That must be like a really long moving average. Where's the thing? Oh, here we go. That's a 200 way up there. Wow, look at that. 200's having a hard time catching up. Yeah, you know, on pullbacks, this might be worthwhile. I mean, you got some overhead supply. I guess that'd be an okay problem to have, though, um, in that case. Uh, Naveen says, Dave, do you think FCX is bottomed? Yeah, I think it's bottomed. That doesn't mean I want to rush out and buy it. Uh, again, it it goes back to the to the the signs, the signal, the setup, and the trigger. So the signs are, yeah, it's bottomed, okay? We don't have a signal and a trigger at this a setup at this point. Greg wants to know about AMBA as a short. Thank you, Greg, for saying short. Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, it is a rel – well, it's been around for a few years. It's a relatively new issue. Um, it's not bad. Uh, I'd like maybe see – since it's at its second leg down, I'd like to see almost a little bit deeper pullback, but certainly not bad. Uh, and Definitely, um, definitely worth keeping on. James, that's on the service. You can't, uh, we can't talk about that one. You know that. I'm not, be I'm not to beat you up though. I mean, I'm just saying you're on the service. So yeah, of course I like it. Uh, BTU, uh, somebody actually brought BTU up. Um, yeah, you know, here's a case where it looks like it's bottomed out. HV is a little crazy at 168. Let's zoom in a little bit. And it's kind of like taking off and then come all the way back in. And I know you might be thinking, well, it's kind of gatekeeper looking. But the, the amount of days in the in the uh, pullback or the whole pattern, a little bit too much. But here's a case of another stock that looks like it's kind of bottom. But the bottom might be a, more of a process than an event. So if it, if it keeps doing this and stays at or above those prior lows and then begins to rally back up, yeah, absolutely, it might be worthwhile. But you might be a while on that one, though, okay? So not necessarily uh, – right away w-r-e-s w-r-e-s yeah i mean this is one that i've been keeping an eye on uh but it's cheap you know it, it it's it's down here at low levels kind of a penny stock but absolutely yeah this is this is actually on my um watch listed here uh so i have to give you a high five i think it's a bow tie my bow ties are broke at the moment but uh you can see so far so good on that one uh yeah absolutely a little overhead supply to deal with uh, it's quite, quite speculative issue. So, you know, stupid HV of 160. So, you know, big grain of salt there. Very dangerous stock to trade. But, yeah, it's, it's you know, which I guess uh, I guess use a 57 cent stop. Uh, <laughs> you know, or buy it at 65 and, and, and risk no more than 65 cents on the trade. You know, the beauty is this, and, and, and you don't want to look at it this way, but, you um, it's a big if. It, it, the problem is you don't know. But if you, there's a reason why this stock's at 60 cents because there's obviously something wrong with the company. But if you knew that they would never go out of business, this is what uh, uh, Joe Corona used to call options that never expire. Uh, because I think back in uh, 2000, bear market, back when he was writing uh, for tradingmarkets.com, Joe would say things like uh, he would got a lot of questions about. He was an options guy. He worked with uh, or on and off with Tony Saliba, who's of uh, Market Wizards fame. Uh, but anyway, the uh, Joe would often get emails from people about options that never expire, meaning that a stock that's been beaten up so much that it's cheap, it would be like buying options that never expire, so to speak. The only problem is if the company expires, that's the only, that's the bottom line there. But if, if you, if you do, and that's a big if, obviously that the company wouldn't go out of business, then by all means, yeah, options are never expire, but super, super speculative, super, super dangerous. But I hear you. I like it. 
Rig. Yeah, Rig's kind of turning the corner a little bit. Uh, looks like they kind of uh, survived their uh, destroying our coastlands over here. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not going to confuse the issue with facts. If they begin to set up, then um, by all means. But, yeah, it's looking uh, like it's bottoming out. Not quite set up just yet. Okay. Today's IPO, Ridgen, XVIO. RG and X open at 30, high 32, consolidating back to open price. Am I consolidation due to the FOMC report? No, 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 no. Um, an IPO biotech is not going to um, is not going to to be held hostage by a um, a Fed report. I mean that's. That's the ultimate and inefficient stocks. By the way, I, I meant to mention this earlier. Um, you know, I've been a big fan of IPOs, did a course on IPOs, and uh, there have been fewer and fewer opportunities in IPOs lately, but there are a few, like um, I think James just brought up one a few minutes ago that we've been watching. There are a few that have defied gravity and gone higher. And the beauty right now, and it's, it's I don't want to get too far into this because I think it's a presentation in and of itself. Uh, in the in the IPO course, I talked about the fact that sometimes they die and die, and sometimes they fly and fly. And fly and fly, meaning they go up and they go up, and, and die means they go down and they go down. Well, lately, the beauty has been, not that there's been any opportunities, but the beauty has been that the die and die has been so obvious. They come public, and then they just die, and very few are actually uh, flying. So... There's only a few to look at for possible longs at this juncture, and there's a plethora that should be afforded. So even if you don't get the course, which I suggest you do, then just know that let them trade for about a week, and if they start dropping like a stone, don't buy them. It's kind of like the old Will Rogers. Will Rogers? Yeah, Will Rogers thing. I almost said Roy Rogers. Uh, <laughs> kind of like the old Will Rogers thing. If they don't go up, don't buy them and that doesn't necessarily work exactly you know that's kind of like i know he's being facetious or was being facetious but in general in markets established stocks yeah it's a little tougher to apply that but in ipos it can actually work quite well you could stay out of a lot of trouble by just avoiding the ones that go down all right we're gonna have to pick it up pick up the pace cpe cpe um you know another another energy stock kind of wide and loose uh I, I would avoid this one and go after some of those other ones that are at lower levels and bottoming out. This was just kind of too wide and loose. A little bit of electrocardiogram HD. Uh, I would buy HV with both fists, both fists, because I've been uh, I've been giving them all my money lately <laughs> in this remodel. Now, all kidding aside, um, you know we got this funky bar here, which is just a function of the market. I wouldn't get too excited about that, but it's made a nice kind of high level base. Uh, but the arrow is sideways. But yeah, if it breaks out, maybe on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. E E M for Phil. Uh, as a short, possibly. This is uh, the these are your emerging shares. I used to I used to spend a lot of time um, looking at that that and I think EFA and other you know, stuff. And then I just have lost kind of interest in more recent times. But yeah, as a possible short. I mean, kind of a too many days of the pullback, but with a um, with an index, they're more indexes, indices are more efficient, so sometimes you have to be a little more lenient. Okay, Rig, we covered that. Anthem, A N T M, A N T M, is that Anthem? Yeah, uh, yeah, it looks like a short at first glance. You got to thrust down, you got to pull back. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit though, it's it's like too many days in the pullback. But yeah, this stock still looks like it's in trouble, Phil. I know what you're doing. You're doing a you're doing a throwback to the 50-day moving average. Ah, there you are, busted. Yeah. That's exactly what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it looks okay. And, and I know you have your uh, methodology there. So, yeah, I, I think it looks okay. Uh, it, it doesn't completely fit my methodology, but I certainly can't argue with it too much. Thomas wants me to guess. I saw a woman about 300 pounds, and she was wearing guest jeans. And uh, I said, I don't know, 300, 310? Biscuit shy of 200? <laughs> Biscuit shy of 300? Um. No, it's just bumping up against its old highs. But, hey, that's a pretty uh, impressive feat uh, given this market. 
No, it doesn't trade that cleanly. It's kind of all over the place. You know, if it if it starts rallying and looking great and then pulls back, uh, then I might get excited. Like I said last week, uh, it's going to have to be one charming pig for me to get excited about it. Take a look at FL for Thomas also. Yeah, I mean, this would look like it was in trouble last week, and then now it's just kind of clawing its way higher. And this is why you use a liberal entry, like an entry right below this low or even below this low on that pullback. And that keeps you out of trouble. But now it's kind of clawing its way back to old highs. Uh, would that be considered a – that's a non-durable. So I guess that might be considered defensive stock, I guess. People still wear shoes in bear markets. CHRW for Thomas. Uh, I'm not a big fan of some of these uh, shipping companies. I guess it's a freight company. I find the freight companies tend to be choppy, and shipping companies in general tend to be choppy. I mean, look at this stock. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. But there's no structure here to work around. It's all over the place. So I'd pass on that one. Don, Don's here, and he wants to know about, you guessed it, F. Uh, there's nothing There's nothing for me here. I mean, it's just, it's zoomed down, zoomed back up. If anything, it's just going sideways for a while. Um, yeah, it's all over the place. There's nothing there for me, Don. WTW, WTW is kind of interesting. I, I picked it apart a little bit recently in a service. Uh, it's got some overhead supply to deal with. But, yeah, longer term, looks like a pretty serious bottom is in place there. I don't like this gap down. It's just, you know, I zoom in on it. I like it, but I back out the chart a little bit. I don't like it as much. It's not set up now, though. It has to continue to rally. If it could get past this overhead supply, let's extend this line out. So if it can get above, like, $8, $9 a share, you know, you think, well, why wait for it to get there? Why not buy it now? Well, for all the reasons I talked about earlier, trade within your methodology. Vivas? Vivas, Las Vegas. I'll be in Las Vegas soon. Too much overhead supply, but, yeah, nice little pullback there. I hear you. Cliff for Don. CLF. CLF. Uh, too much overhead supply. Uh, and then it's it's also kind of pulled back. It's kind of like you had your initial setup here. You see I have it drawn in. It rallied up and came right back in. We had this on the service, and I didn't like it because of the overhead supply. And, again, doesn't have to stop there. But like I said, it's like, ah, it's all, it looks like it can only rally up to overhead supply. And that's exactly what it did. I guess it'd be worth a trade in those particular cases. But I prefer to, to – it's just hard to um, – it's hard to make money longer term if you don't allow yourself for the potential unlimited gains. If you just – uh, trading for a trade. I mean, it's fun for us at G's, but it's hard to make money longer term. Uh, this one's just kind of uh, sideways in here. I think I'd pass on that one. DNR for Gunther. Hope I got your name right. Uh, it's at a downtrend, but it looks like it's kind of slowing down in a downtrend. I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet, though. But if it's set up, it looks like it's oversold longer terms. This sort of natural resources is, is uh, I don't know what kind of natural re is that oil and gold and other things or, but yeah, it looks like it's kind of in the early phases of forming a bottom. But uh, I think it's gonna be more of a process than an event. All right, sell for John. Um. It would have to break out past the recent highs in here before I would get too excited about it. But I hear you. It looks like it's bottomed and taken off. It's already up a couple hundred percent off those lows. A little on the thin side, though, so uh, we certainly have to be careful. Naveen, you're welcome. Viab for Gabrielli. Viab. Uh, he has a short, maybe, but, again, on the short side, you want to be in the stocks that are um, rolling over as a general statement. If you look at it go long, it's kind of rallied off its lows, but it, it's just nothing to get me that excited uh, just yet. It kind of imploded back here. Uh, in a case like that, I'd like to see it actually trade sideways a little more. So, oh, James, no problem. My videos have been screwed up anyway. Uh, I've been having to deal with some issues in that, but we got that fixed for those who are in the service. EFOI. Uh, no, because it's gapped down. It, it, I'm glad you brought this one up because this was one – I already deleted the question. I don't know who brought it up, but thank you. Um, this is one I wanted to show this week as, as, as why you wait for an entry. The stock had a nice – okay, there's your sign. The sign is it's in a beautiful uptrend. 
Okay, let's say you take this TKO or you're looking for it to pull back. Well, by waiting for that trigger or that entry, whatever you want to call it, you would have saved you from this disastrous trade. So isn't that beautiful? Naveen, did you look at Apple yet? No, but we'll do it. Uh, we used to always look at Apple just because everybody wants to know. I'm not a huge fan of Apple. Um, I think Apple is going to reach a point in efficiency where it's going to look a lot like the overall market. Apple's in the Dow. Let's take a look at the Dow just for S&Gs. We're almost out of time. See, Dow looks like this, okay? Which I guess the P's look like that too. Apple, see, it's, it's going to start looking like the overall market more and more. You mark my words on that. Um, and it is part of the Dow, so... But yeah, nothing for me to do in Apple. It's just got it's just again looks like the overall market. Tremendous amount of overhead supply. If anything, possibly short, but I'd leave it alone. All right, Richard, take care, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. A V G O. A V G O. Uh no. Z F G N. Well, this is a stock that's breaking out. If it can keep breaking out, maybe on a pullback. Um, it is kind of in the middle of this big range. Uh, in a case, like right now, I like the stocks at a scraping bottom. Video is very creepy. Hardly can see anything. Please use black, use white background. Um, how does everybody else feel about that? I, I could work a lot better off a of black background. In the uh, live charts, JetBlue, JetBlue looks pretty good. I almost left them white. Um, I'll be happy to explore that. You guys, give me some feedback on that. Uh, JetBlue looks pretty good. Maybe on a pullback, black is better. Okay, Carol likes black. Don likes black. Phil likes black. White hurts my eyes. All right, looks like uh, looks like we're gonna stay in black for a while. Okay. Uh, maybe on pullbacks. I'm not a big fan of. Uh, of airlines, but you know, as a trader, I might be forced in on a pullback. Thank you, Dave. It's first time to come by here. We'll talk to you later. Oh, Naveen, thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thanks for the feedback. Looks like we're going to stay with black for a little while. I'm, I'm, my apologies to those who prefer the white. I like the white in the chart. I like the white of the slides so I could draw on them, but the black in the actual charts. Okay. You're welcome, Aaron. Okay. Um, Back in black, AC Anthem for the show. Oh, that sounds great. We can try that. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to go ahead and wrap. I know we got some some unanswered questions, but uh, I like to keep the recordings right around an hour and a half. Uh, thank you guys so much for attending. I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored that we still have questions after an hour and a half. Um, but I'm honored to be here. I'm, I'm humbled by your presence. Thank you so much. Anything unanswered, feel free to shoot me an email. And um, if it's uh, a question requiring a lot of thought, uh, just uh, hang in there and I'll be happy to uh, I'll use it as fodder for next week's show. So I appreciate that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for attending and um, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next week. A dope, Gabrielle. Gabrielle. You're great, Dave. Oh, thank you, John. John's a show. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend.